right here. I'm not wandering anywhere. I'm going to adjust this very slightly. Okay, I'm here to talk to you about life within the Overton window, the challenges of company diversity programs. Uh, I'm Kara, as you can tell, uh, and you've just heard a little bit about me. Uh, I manage community evangelism team at Tech Co. Inc. You can look me up and see where I work. It's not really a secret, but I'm not including my company's name in this because this isn't a story about XYZ thing that happened at a particular company. It's just about strategies that I've found effective working at a company over time. Uh, I will, however, tell you a little bit more about Tech Co. Inc. Uh, it grew from 75 to 550 employees in my roughly five and a half years there so far. So it's a smaller company. It's also a company that actively values diversity. Uh, Pro-diversity is basically meaningless since a company isn't a person, it's a conglomeration. So there's provided only to say that things were a little easier for me than they would be at some other places and nothing more. Before I move on, <laughs> I want to do a small aside on advice since I'm clearly going to peddle some here. I urge you to be wary of categorical advice, which scares me. For this talk, I'm only discussing what I've found effective in my particular experience at a particular company as a white woman with a whole host of privileges. I only have 20 minutes, so it's obviously not going to be the whole picture. And anyway, this only applies if you're in a safe place to advocate for change at your company, which is not the case for any or even most people. Uh, please also, if you do tweet any of this talk, be mindful of that because this is a very easy talk to take out of context and make it sound like I'm telling people to do unsafe things, which I do not ever want to do. At any given moment, someone is always using the idea of effective change to tell us that we're doing things wrong. It's popular to use this as derailment, silencing, or tone policing. People will continue to say that you are going about change wrong, even if you attempt to uh, affect change by whispering into a Tupperware and hiding that Tupperware at the bottom of an abandoned well in a deep forest. I don't want this talk to be like that, and I don't want to tell anyone here what they should do. I'm just going to say, as I've mentioned, what I've found effective, uh, much of which I've only had the energy to impart because of my own privileges. Ultimately, a story of living within the Overton window is a story about shrinking, compromising, and smiling too much. Things that should be taken only in moderation at best. And with that caveat, onto the Overton window. Uh, it's originally a very libertarian thing, so uh, I'm sorry if that's not my jam at all, but it's still a very useful way of thinking about influencing change. So let's go over it. The idea is that, that any idea or concept kind of exists on a scale of public opinion. The center here is the window, the window of political possibility, that represents current public discourse. The idea is that politicians will make policy based on what's popular, not on their own personal opinions. Uh, so the way to change policy is actually just to shift the window of public opinion. There's a lot of issues with this simple framing, and the way it's constructed, thinks, thanks to its libertarian right-wing think tank parentage, uh, where issues are presented on a freedom scale based on how much the government intervenes, which we all know isn't really related to freedom at all. So we're going to ditch those. We'll go, we'll go with a really simple, oh, it's gone. It's gone. Is it, is it coming back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> No problem. Uh, we'll, we'll go with a simple left to right for the current political spectrum, even though that's disgustingly oversimplified. And what does that even mean? I don't know. The Overton window theory is mostly about strategies to move the window of that political possibility. And the idea is the best way to move it is by tugging at the edges from outside it. For example, if you want to shift it to the right on a particular issue, you could use a tactic of presenting a very far right version of the issue, making the middle part in between seem normal and shifting the window to the right. We may have seen this recently. Um, I like to use this to think about people working towards similar goals with different tactics and in different spaces. There are folks who are working outside the window, pointing to that perfect space state that we want to head towards. And there are people who are working in the same direction, but they're working from inside the window. Their tactics are different, even if they're aligned on the same goal. For example, one activist might be working outside the window to change the systems of oppression that can't be fixed internally. A lawyer might be working inside the window to change oppressive laws through the existing system that are currently affecting people. I don't think this is exactly what the model is set up for, but it's really helped me to understand different spaces and different tactics working toward the same goals. On issues related to diversity and inclusion, my views are outside the window. <laughs> but when I'm at work, I'm often trapped inside, nudging it slowly 
This talk is about being at work, shrinking to fit into that smaller space, and still working in alignment with my own ethics. I find that I can't just charge into every situation with a heavy-handed, well, blame the patriarchy and also capitalism, even though that's what I'm thinking, am I right? Uh, <laughs> so when I'm finding ways to indicate my views persuasively at work, I ask myself if these lighter versions scale up to the ultimate goal that I'm pointing towards. And this has been very helpful for me to kind of, kind of test, test these light, light versions. Some classic unscalable examples would include, for example, using XX to denote women, when women actually have a variety of chromosomal arrangements. So even if the five founding members of your women's group have had their chromosomes inexplicably checked by a leading chromosomal expert and have the certificates hanging terrifyingly on the wall, that crap is not going to scale to the next person who will run screaming away from you. And it's definitely not going to scale for most trans women either. Another example would be the concept that women are better managers because they're better at communication. It's tempting and it feels true, if I have to be honest, but where does it scale to? Uh, it leads to either biological essentialism that can be used to argue that women are naturally bad at other things, magically the highest paying ones, uh, and also can be weaponized against trans people. And even the socialization route that women are just raised to be better communicators carries the same risks. It doesn't scale to the ultimate idea that there aren't differences between the skills of people of varying genders. Throw it out. So, when do we press for change? This is one that I've really, really struggled with. Let's say a leader has made a mistake. We've all seen a leader make a mistake, if we've seen a leader. Uh, and someone is upset and sends, in this case, him an email, which is a good thing to do. Uh, they're not the only one who's bad about it, though, so someone else also sends an email. And all, actually, a whole bunch of people send emails, because this thing they did was, like, kind of not cool. Uh, and then you send an email, and by the time your email gets to that person, they're really angry. They're defensive. And they don't want to hear it from anyone at all. Uh, I have found that after something unacceptable happens can be very good timing, because many colleagues may be mobilizing, or you might have clear data or evidence that something is a problem. But if those aren't going to further your case, I found that it actually can also be bad timing because leadership can be on the defensive and be very closed down to change. However, after something unacceptable happens somewhere else in the industry, can be good timing. You can capitalize on the shock and sadness, and I know we are not shocked in many cases when something unacceptable happens in the industry, but we notice that many around us are magically shocked. Uh, we can talk about making sure that nothing like that happens here, and the enemy is conceptually elsewhere, minimizing defensiveness and maximizing the potential of allies. Perhaps your allies are closest, at least what I've found, when the problem isn't close at hand. The complexities, pressures, and power dynamics are simplified by the distance. It's also much easier to say, uh, wow, we don't want to be like, say, Uber, than it is to say, wow, that's happening here. So I've spent a lot of time figuring out how to balance reactive and preemptive change. If I say it's happened here, I'm met with defensiveness and denial. If I say it hasn't happened here, uh, why change? Because <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Uh, but if I can say it's happened elsewhere and it could happen here, there's sometimes this magical zone where we can talk about preventing it with best practices. You'll find your own sweet spot, and it varies person by person, but this has helped me somewhat get past defensiveness. Uh, prioritization. Uh, I have found it very valuable to make a list of what I want to change, prioritize it by what I can affect, and then keep shelving and rearranging it as things fail. Um, prioritizing by what I can affect helps keep the wind in my sails with successes, and allowing myself to focus on a few things helps prevent me from getting burnt out. Um, being at the company for a long time means continuing to throw stuff at the wall until something sticks, and often coming back to the things that didn't stick a few years later when things change. I find if I'd write a proposal after a proposal, maybe one out of five would get somewhere, but usually a few years later, someone else would be like, oh, we have this totally fresh, awesome idea, and I'm like, that one, cool. Um, but that's the time to be like, wow, that is a really good idea. I have a few thoughts. You should go do it, rather than... <laughs> uh, oh wow, that failed years ago, like, what are you talking about? Which can be hard to kind of step back and let fresh people be fresh, but keep rearranging that list. But not everything lives on your list. Ideas come from all over, and often 201 level ideas may arrive before those 101 level projects. Ideas don't come prioritized, they come from all over. So you have to 
kind of reorder them as they arrive, and you also have the opportunity to build out those ideas with a foundation that they need. If they're a two-level level idea, what's the foundational work that will make that, that directive successful? So for example, someone threw out the idea, let's have pronoun buttons available at the front desk for interviews. I love pronoun buttons. They're great. They're obviously a best practice. However, did we build a foundation for that to be successful? And that's the point where you can build back up and say, what are the list of things, where would this actually be on the list? In this case, as an example list, it would come after, for example, trying to pursue transgender inclusive healthcare. It would come after adding pronoun etiquette to the hiring training to make sure that you don't have hiring managers that are gonna make a rude joke and drive your candidate away. You wanna do this work before you get to that 201 level item, even if that's the idea that happened to pop up and that's exciting and that is a current best practice. So building out this priority list has helped me on the foundational side as well to make sure that we're not jumping ahead for things that um, are actually gonna end up <clears throat> undercutting marginalized people because the support isn't there for them. Uh, I am gonna talk about collaborating with HR. Uh, I would like to reiterate, you might not be in a place where it is safe to do this. And if you're not, do not throw yourself into the lion's den. But if you wanna throw yourself in the lion's den, let's talk about it. Uh, HR, may not, <laughs> HR may not be your friend, um, but you can be their friend. Uh, HR is mostly really well-meaning people working with an imbalanced, poorly built system that enables great, good, or evil. Like occasionally with any team, you're gonna get a super bad apple, but like most of them are like decent people who are like, you yeah, know, trying to make people's lives better. They're just within a system that causes them to break people's lives horribly sometimes. But, uh, so it's, it's not helpful if say you've been harassed and they're not handling it ethically. But it is helpful if you're making slow improvements that make them look good, you can productively work with them. And learning how to partner with HR can make a big difference for diversity initiatives. HR may want to protect the company first, but most people in HR actually want to make positive changes when they feel within reach. So for me, HR touches or controls a large percentage of the things that I want to change. If I want to change hiring practices, firing practices, employee review practices, pay equity, diversity programs, sponsorship, philanthropy, the employee manual. I mean, this is stuff that affects people every day at the company. This goes through HR. So that's how you end up spending years building a relationship with HR and learning how to work with them. Uh, and it does pay off. Um, so one thing that's helped me in understanding what HR is trying to measure themselves against. And there's a lot of things that go in here, so I'll just talk about one thing. If a company takes government contracts, they're required to measure and report back on certain diversity metrics. Um, the government has to measure them against a percentage of available people for that role. I remember HR showing me a chart of where we were at to explain why they were focusing on certain areas. I noticed that 11% was the goal for women in leadership. Once we hit 11%, we were winning, according to the government. There wasn't really an incentive to work on that again, because we had succeeded. Now, I don't really feel like 11% is a success, but this often helps explain why certain things are being focused on. Um, I have found myself frequently asking, uh, why are we doing this? Like, th there has to be a reason. There's always a reason. The fact that something is a mistake is not enough to fix it. You need to know why in order to change it. Another example is recently when I was complaining about listing a degree in a job posting. And I learned that in some cases, we're required to include a degree for governmental reasons. The, but it means that we can post on governmental sites that actually get us a larger diversity in our applicants. This means that I know my best path forward is to ask that we add or equivalent experience whenever we mention a degree, not that we abolish the degree entirely. Examples like this come up all the time, and that's why going in with questions first gets you much better results. I've also had to learn to articulate the return on investment of diversity programs, uh, which feels really gross. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I was highly resistant to this. I remember typing up a plan for an important diversity program for an event and then being told by a lukewarm executive that they wanted to see the ROI. I was livid, that's monstrous. Um, but I wanted the program to go through and I didn't actually know how to argue the business side of basic ethics. Uh, so I turned to another executive, a woman with many years of experience in the industry for help. She wasn't always as cutting edge in her diversity advocacy as I had wanted. But in this case, she could help me translate my desire to get this program funded into business logic to get what I wanted. And I was benefiting from her many years walking that line in the industry. Let's talk about working with your colleagues, which you do every day. Uh, the best work that I have done is always coordinated work. Coordinating privately with people that I trust at the company. Because everyone has different visibility into the situations and they have different power to affect them. This means that you have to let the right person handle the issue. Learning to step back and say, 
who is the person who can affect this is crucial. And then not indicating that you're working in tandem because you're going to seem like a secret conspiracy, which, I mean, I don't know, maybe you are. Uh, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but you don't want to be labeled as a clique that's always pushing for this. Having different people push for different things at different times in coordination so you don't all hit that exec with the same angry email at once is crucial. And it means that many of your wins will be private, unseen, and uncelebrated. Most of the stuff that I'm most proud about, I can't talk about with you here today. That's how it goes. Oh no, that's a five minute warning. Okay, uh, <laughs> use affinity groups for broad effect. In my case, uh, this would be for example, the women's group. An example is we had a new head of HR star and I wanted them to know that they were, I wanted to know what they were like. I could have scheduled a one-on-one, -on -one, but instead I invited them to do a Q and A lunch with the women's group and invited the whole company. Because the invite was from the women's group, it wasn't just me being weird. Uh, and because the whole company was invited, in this case, it gave it greater legitimacy. And now everyone can figure out what the new head of HR was like. Uh, affinity groups are really good for broad things like this, even when they're not great for small tactical stuff. I've also found it's really important to learn to work across different company experiences. When someone first enters a company, they may be really excited that it's much better than their last environment. They're talking about how this place is incredible, and they want to keep it that way. Someone else who's been there for a few years can see the cracks, and they've been betrayed. They might feel that this place is terrible and they want to make it better. Both of these people have the same goal, the same aim, and learning to work across both those groups of people on a shared initiative without making either of them feel like their viewpoint, which is completely valid, is wrong, is really important. I once, uh, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna give a quick chat room caveat. Any space that is sufficiently random, accessible, or inclusive will mirror the conversation of a main room or a public channel. Essentially, a space that isn't small or curated will mirror the Overton window. And this is really important to understand when working with groups. This is at least my experience. I once organized a chat room containing women who'd been invited to dinners intended to give the women access to the CEO's ear. After the second dinner happened with randomly selected women, the discussion turned to how is it fair that women get this special dinner? We should be inviting men to these. It's going to mirror the window space. Uh, oh, don't drag down the new recruits. People come in with fresh hope. They don't need your old scars. Uh, and other people are going to grow too. Like, that person who, yeah, week one is like, you're the PC police. Like, year two, like, they, whatever happened, like, they had a baby, and they came back, and people treated them differently, and they, like, learned about feminism. Maybe they're <laughs> healthy. Seriously, it happens. So, tech changes people. Uh, let's talk about managing fragility in our last few minutes. This is uh, from our, our past CEO, CEO, who I'm a big fan of, from a blog post of his. In the fall of 2014, I had dinner with eight women who worked at my company. This was my most difficult experience as CEO. They were pissed off. Their experience was very different from what I thought was happening. And hearing it directly from them hurt. Hearing it directly from them hurt. Whoops, whoops, I went back. This is from someone who was actively working to understand issues affecting underrepresented groups in tech and actively open to learning. It still hurt. And while that story has a good ending, for most people that hurt turns into defensiveness. And your pain is hurting the fragile people who are supposed to be supporting you, which is not fair at all. It's not okay but that's how it goes. In, in a certain way, there's almost this Overton window of fragility with disgusted, like, oh, that thing that happened is so gross on one end, and the other being like, what, you want me to do something about it? Nothing went wrong. And you're trying to fit in this perfect space in the middle. Building allies necessitates being gentle. For some people, you can never be gentle enough. Don't, you don't need them as an ally. Um, only ask for help if it's something that those allies can impact. You don't want to overextend them because they can actually lose their ability to affect things. If I think, for example, a male ally is currently losing sway with leaders, I won't bring issues to them for a few months to make sure that they can rebuild that traction. And I'm very understanding that they can't help or they don't feel in a safe position, even if they have more privilege than me, because they actually need to mediate their own, their own chips. If you're trying to get something through upper management, have a high-level sponsor take it on and actually do that thing where you like change the shape of the pretzel to fit what the execs like to eat for dinner, because there's a reason people do it with their other initiatives. Oh, no. Uh, make complaints so productive that it hurts. I can't stand hearing these people are just complaining. They don't have productive solutions. This doesn't come from people who are saying it in good faith. These people are saying it in bad faith. But you can use the bystander effect to make your complaints so productive that everyone around you is like, oh, obviously they're being productive right now. At the end of the day, uh, I end up trapped in a world of yes and. One of the rules of comedy is never say no. Only say yes and. You know, we're doing a better job than most companies at this kind of stuff, people say to me constantly. And I'm screaming, the bar is a snake pit filled with vipers! But instead, 
I say, yes, and here's what we can do now that would really make us industry leading. Uh, these incidents you mentioned are how we do things here, and I'm screaming, you can't erase reality with your wishes, you monster. But I'm saying, yes, and here's how we can ensure that for the future. It forces me to celebrate wins, even imperfect ones. Because if you don't celebrate their current efforts, they're not going to let you work on new ones. But all this smiling is getting exhausting. And you live in the window. You are cramped. There's not a lot of air to breathe. You can never stop smiling. And everyone can see you through the glass. If you're like me, maybe you'll go hide in the bathroom where the walls are solid and you can cry and read Twitter and text. And it's great. You are miserable here in the window. Everything changes very slowly. Everything you do is held against you. And everything you don't do, you hold against yourself. You can also get out of the window. You can let someone else take a shift. You can do some frowning. I've spent a lot of time learning how to combat society's unfair expectations of me, in my case, as a woman. And I spend my free time trying to make my understanding of social justice more pure and more good. Uh, but that purity shows us where we need to head, not always how to tackle immediate things in the present. And so learning to do diversity work at my workplace has taught me to be patient, to explain my steps, to forgive, to do what's going to be most effective, unless, of course, it involves throwing vulnerable people or groups under the bus in the name of symbolic process. It feels good to be effective, but it doesn't feel good to shrink my words and actions, and it's not a healthy long term. I encourage you to reflect back on Julia Cagano's excellent talk from Alter Conf Portland last year, Make Career Survival for People Who Don't Want to Be Attrition Statistics When They Grow Up, that encourages you to stop doing diversity work and tells you it is definitely bad for you. Uh, it's a great talk, and the slides are all online, and I 100% agree with it. Um, and I like to end my talks with something happy, so my company built a diversity inclusion role full time. Hired a woman of color who's been working at the company for many years. She's awesome, and I can rest a little on my second shift. Additional resources, I, I encourage you to check out Liz Fong Jones' excellent talk, How to Change Tech Company Policy by Organizing Tech Workers. And I also encourage you to check out Project Include, which is really good for working with leaders and executives interested in how they can improve the company. Thank you so much. <laughs>